All right. Well, I think I wanted to start with something small this morning, like, what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? 42. See, nobody gets that anymore. Yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, really? No? Yeah. Okay. And if you're, if you're a City Slickers fan, then the meaning of life is one thing, right? And if you're a James Taylor fan, the secret of life is enjoying the passage of time, which isn't too bad, actually. I like that. But if we really want to know what the secret of life is, the meaning of life, I think Jesus is giving us some pretty good clues in what we're going to talk about this morning. And so let's see if we can dig a little deeper and see if Jesus can give us what he sees as a foundational aspect of what this life is all about. We've been talking about healings. Uh, we've been going through uh, primarily from the end of Mark 1 and over into across the bar line, across the, the border into Mark 2, where Jesus does three healings in rapid succession. In fact, one right after another. There's no break in between. And as we've talked about, when you see stories or, or images that are juxtaposed, that are placed in proximity right next to each other, it's because they're supposed to be understood together. Often they redefine each other, they reinforce the meaning of each other, but we need to take a look at them together because they're trying to tell us something that needs to be reinforced. You know, just like when you hear something for the third time, it's like it really starts to sink in. You hear it, you hear it again, it's like, oh, where did I hear that before? And then you hear it a third time and it starts to sink in. Sometimes this repetition, which is part of Jewish poetry as well, makes a big difference and it really allows us to sink deeper. What is Lexio Divina about? But hearing something successive times and being able to sink deeper and deeper into the meaning of it. So was it three Sundays ago? Um, we uh, talked about Jesus healing the leper. Leper comes to Jesus, calls him over. If you're willing, you can declare me cleansed. You can cleanse me. And uh, Jesus touches him first and then heals him. Last Sunday, the paralytic is lowered through a hole in the roof. They actually dig out a hole or they pull back the awning. We don't know which, but at any rate, they can't get in through the front door because the house is so jammed. And so they, they put him in through the roof. And Jesus first says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he heals him. Jesus is always out of order from our point of view, right? Always something going on there. Today, we're going to talk about the call of Levi. And even though Levi doesn't get a physical healing, he gets a spiritual one. And I think that's really the focus of all of these three. When we look at them together, they are much more about the spiritual healing that is taking place rather than the physical healings. And I would say that probably goes with everything in the Bible, everything in the Gospels. The spiritual meaning, the spiritual layer, takes much more precedence and has much more meaning and import to us, especially here and now. We need to pay attention to that. I know we want to focus on the miracles and the head-turning spectacular things, but if we can look through that into what's happening, it makes a big difference. Now, the first thing that we notice from all of these three individuals, the leper, the paralytic, and the tax collector, because Levi's a tax collector, is that they're all outcasts, right? Now, the first two have a physical malady that has pushed them out of society. Leprosy, we talked about how they had to be outside the city walls. They couldn't come close. They had to mask up, and they had to distance and do all that, and they could not be a part of the community anymore. But the paralytic was much the same. As soon as you were out of balance, as soon as you had some sort of physical malady like that, the Jews understood that to be the result of sin. And so that required repentance, that re required healing, that required uh, a ceremony and a, and a ritual purity ceremony that would take place at the temple uh, with the priests. And so they are outside the community as long as the visible signs of their ailment uh, are open to all. Now, the tax collector has a moral malady rather than a spiritual one. And we need to take the, the tax collector, the tax man, and put that person into this context because it's so much deeper. I mean, who really likes tax collectors? I mean, do you really like tax collectors? Does anybody like tax collectors? But in this society, at this time, it was really at a whole different level. 
Tax collectors were understood as beasts with human form. That's the way that they were actually referred to. They were also referred to as licensed robbers, which actually was pretty true in, in most cases. But they were put on equal terms with prostitutes and with gamblers and thieves, drunkards and dishonest herdsmen. It's something you don't hear every day, but, you know, cattle rustlers, right? They're put on the same level as all of those people. Uh, in the rabbinical writing that is uh, current, concurrent with the time, there is no hope for the tax collector, no hope for the tax man. They are excluded from all religious and secular community, completely on the outside. That means they can't buy or sell. They can't, they can't connect with anybody who is uh, of Jewish extraction, who is living within the law. They can't have anything to do with them, which means in order just to be able to go buy your groceries, he had to go to the Greek part of town because they didn't care, right? But he couldn't do anything with his Jewish countrymen. So even their money that he had, his money was unclean. If he gave you money and you touched the money, that made you ritually unclean. You had to go to the temple. You had to go to the priest and get yourself cleaned up. It defiled anyone who was touching it. He couldn't serve as a witness in the court couldn't basically do anything, completely excluded. Now, why was this so severe in that culture? These tax gatherers, these tax collectors, were hated as allies with Rome. Remember, this is the time of the Roman occupation. By the time Jesus is on the scene, it had been going on for about 70 years or so. And so the Roman occupation is well driven into the national consciousness by at least a two, three generations by this time. They saw the tax gatherers as allied with the Romans, and they were a reminder of the Roman occupation. And now, you know, many or most of them were dishonest because they were licensed robbers. They had a license to kill. They had a license to, uh, to mess with the people. And when you think about it, who else would take a job like that, that they knew was going to put them on the outside of their own people? And so, yes, they were, they were kind of a fulfilling prophecy and which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Now, this tax system of the Romans is really complicated. We tend to think of the ancients as being primitive, but they were anything but. These high civilizations, the Greco-Roman civilizations, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, any of these ancient civilizations were highly sophisticated and highly complex. They rivaled anything that we've got now. The only thing that separates us from the ancient peoples are technology, you know? They had bows and arrows, they've got laser-guided missiles, but when you look at the systems, when you look at their government, when you look at their taxes, I mean, it reads just like anything that we are dealing with now. So there is no separation there. So the people's feeling toward these tax gatherers, because the taxes were so usurious, because there was so much corruption, is understandable. And then you add to it that they were occupied by Rome, it just ups the ante because they believed that they were supposed to be a sovereign nation. God promised them a sovereign nation. And here they were for nearly 400 years under the boot of successive regimes that have come through. Now, Rome is an interesting one. Rome didn't really have, it's sometimes been called the empire without a soul, the civilization without a soul, because they really didn't have a guiding philosophy the way the Greeks did or even the Assyrians or the Babylonians. So when they conquered a people, their main objective was a revenue source. You could continue to practice your own religion. You could continue to have your own culture as long as you paid tribute to Rome, as long as you didn't cause any problems, as long as you kept the peace, as long as you let the army do what it needed to do through your lands. And most importantly, you kept that revenue flowing. Rome was a beast that constantly had to be fed. And so that source of income was so important. So what they did in the areas that they conquered, would they would license out or they would sell the positions of the tax collector. You, you could think of it as a franchise. You know, you get a franchise. We just got a Popeye's down in South County. So, you know, Popeye's, you get a franchise and you open it up. Basically, that's what's happening. They're franchising out this position of tax gatherer, which was going to be very lucrative for the people who did it, to locals. Now, these weren't Romans who were carrying this out. These were local people who would get a license to be the tax collector for Rome. 
all right? Now, there were chief tax collectors, and they were in charge of entire districts. Zacchaeus, you might remember Zacchaeus, the story of him. He was a chief tax collector. They were the ones who had the primary contract with Rome. They got all the big bucks, and then they would hire tax gatherers underneath them. Now, there were two types of taxes. There were direct taxes and indirect taxes. And the direct taxes were collected by those called gabai. That was, that was their name. Now, what are direct taxes? Those would be income taxes. Real property taxes, which would include not only, as we think of as homes being real property, but this would be the land primarily and the produce, the crops and the herds and everything that was on the land. You pay taxes on that as well. And then you had a poll tax which was kind of a, a head tax. You just paid that because you were alive, and if you were a woman, you were between the ages of 12 and 65, and if you were a man, you were between the ages of 14 and 65. Boys got a little bit later start. But anyway, your productive years, so you paid a tax just because you're alive and breathing in the Roman Empire between those ages, regardless of your income, regardless of any real property you have. Now, those direct taxes, they were pretty state. There was a schedule of those taxes. And so everybody knew what they were, knew what they had to pay, and the goodbye would collect them. But then the indirect taxes were different. The indirect taxes were the tolls. Think of toll roads. We kind of hate those too, don't we? The toll roads. But you had toll roads, you had duties, you had market fees. And these were collected by a different group of tax collectors called mochs. And these were the, the tax gatherers that were really, really despised, much more than the Gabai, much more than the chief tax collectors. Why was that? Because the, these indirect taxes were kind of at the discretion of the tax gatherer. They could set tolls on roads and bridges. And they could set them the way they wanted to. They could set tolls on the beasts of burden, the animals that were carrying the carts. They could set tolls and taxes on each axle. They could set tolls and taxes and tariffs on everything they wanted and every item. And so these toll booths were set up on major trade routes. And everybody who came by was stopped by the tax gatherer. And this is what really got difficult. You got a caravan coming through. They would make you unload every last item on your caravan so that they could see every item and assess a tax on it, and then you had to load it back up again. And you had multiple toll booths through the course of your journey, and every time you hit this, you had to unload. And they would game you, and they would scam you, and they would totally just these usurious fees. And that was just debilitating to the people. So these people were absolutely despised. That's why it is so interesting when we see the way Jesus handles Levi when he passes his toll booth along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, as he will in this story. Now, there's a pattern here between these three, the leper, the paralytic, and the tax collector. They are all being forced outside the community. They're being forced outside of connection with their people. They have no connection whatsoever as were the adulterers and the prostitutes, the Samaritans, the Romans. There was a blanket term that the Jews used for all these people. They called them Am Ha'aretz. Am Ha'aretz. And that literally meant people of the land, but what it meant was people who stood outside of the law. They didn't follow the purity codes. They didn't follow the law. They stood outside of all of the the ethnic markers and the religious markers that the Jews held dear. And all of these people were anathema. All these people are excluded. If you touch these people, you are ritually unclean. Now, Jesus' acceptance for all of these and everyone is unconditional. Before healing, before anybody makes amends, before there's any restoration, he is right there. He touches the leper, making himself ritually unclean before he heals him. He declares that the sins are forgiven of the paralytic before there is any amends, before he knows if there's any repentance. It doesn't matter to Jesus. He calls him son. That was the intimate and familiar and, and affectionate term for a family member. And now with Levi, he's going to do the same thing. This acceptance of Jesus is not based on performance. It's based on the intrinsic value of each human being that he encounters. Each human being 
has his acceptance, has his love, has his attention, regardless of who they are, regardless of how far outside the law they stand. So let's take a look and see what Jesus does with Levi, starting at Mark 2, verse 13. And he went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he, Levi, got up and followed him. Another story, just here's the call and here's the response. Now, we talked about this a few weeks ago where there was a building up to this. Most likely, people knew Jesus. They had a chance to get to know him before. They just blindly followed him. But here is that response to a call. When Jesus calls them out into deeper water for that miraculous catch of fish, there is a spiritual part of it. He's being called out to something deeper, and he responds. Now, here's the parallel in Matthew 9, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he, Matthew, got up and followed him. And then in Luke 5, another parallel. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his, in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. Okay, so here in the three synoptic gospels are the same story being told. Now, you probably noticed something right off the bat, right? What's his name? <laughs> now, Mark calls him Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Matthew calls him Matthew. And Luke calls him Levi. Just Levi, no last name. So which is it? Is it Levi or is it Matthew? And does it really matter? Well, just to, you know, just to fill in some blanks here, traditionally, the church has understood that Levi and Matthew were the same person. And there's no real explanation why he's called Levi and why he's called Matthew. And so you have these three synoptics calling him by different names. There is no Levi listed in the list of apostles that uh, Matthew gives us in chapter 10. But in chapter 10, verse 3, there is a James, son of Alphaeus, that is listed as one of the apostles. And in variant manuscripts that were not canonized, they didn't make the canon, this James is called the tax collector that would correspond with these canonical stories. So you've got Levi, you've got Matthew, and you've got James now, all kind of vying for this position. Is it the same person with just different names? Is it different people? that have different functions? Are Levi and James brothers? Because they both are listed as the son of Alphaeus. And of course, we can't know. There's no way for us to be able to, to untangle this. But I suppose the traditional view is as good as any, that Levi and Matthew are referring to the same person. And you know, this is one of the vagaries of the Gospels and the ancient uh, sacred texts. You know, they aren't writing the way we would want to write something that was absolutely accurate in every aspect. They're doing it for different points of view and different perspectives. And of course, they're playing with accuracy to be able to get across deeper spiritual truths. And I think that's really what's at play here. The most important thing for us is not the identity or the name of this person, but the call and the response. That's what we need to take a look at. And the nature of that call. And the nature of that call in the context of a tax collector. That's really the big piece. Jesus says to follow me without condition. He doesn't, he doesn't, we don't know if there's any relationship between him and this person. He must have passed that toll booth several times because that was his base of operations, was around Capernaum and around the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so wherever this was, he had probably passed several times and had a chance to observe him. But without any condition on his part, Matthew's still doing his job. We don't know how honest he was about doing his job, but he was still doing his job. And Jesus just calls him, follow me. You kind of get the impression he's already passed the booth and he's kind of looking back over his shoulder. Hey, you want to follow? Come on, let's go. And he arises. The interesting thing about the word that is used there for arise, it's the same word that is used when Jesus arises on Easter Sunday. That resurrection, he arose, is the same word that's here. Matthew, Levi, arises out of that tax booth and leaves everything behind. Can you imagine the scramble for all the stacks of money that maybe were on that booth? Because he just leaves and leaves it all there. The confusion, 
how happy the caravans that came right after would be. There's nobody in the booth. But he just arises and he leaves everything. The way that the disciples on the shore left their nets, just dropped everything and followed Jesus. That relinquishment of old ideas, that relinquishment of old ways, moving into something new. We always want to think of this from a spiritual perspective. And then the story of Zacchaeus comes to mind. Remember Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax gatherer, but he was a short guy. And Jesus was coming through, and the crowd was preceding him, and he wanted to have a view of him, so he climbs a fig tree, and he's up in the tree, and Jesus comes in the tree and looks up, Zacchaeus, get down from there. we got to have dinner tonight. Tax gatherer? And here is a, a Jew's Jew who stands well inside the law, saying, we got to have dinner tonight. Could you imagine the consternation? Could you imagine the whispers and the sideways glances that are going on when he says that? And Zacchaeus can't get down off that tree fast enough. And he immediately says, you know what? I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor around me. And anybody that I have cheated, I'm going to repay them four times. Now, Jesus must have known that he was an accident waiting to happen. He must have known that he was right here, right ready, right? And all he needed was the slightest provocation. But there was still no ritual restitution here. There was still no ability for Jesus to come into his company, take food from his hand without becoming ritually unclean. But this is another part of the story. These happen over and over and over again. That light motif is there, right? That overarching pattern is there over and over again of Jesus' unconditional acceptance. And so Levi does the same thing. He gives a great big dinner party for Jesus. Let's take a look at Mark 2, starting at verse 15. And it happened that he, Jesus, was reclining at the table in his, Levi, Matthew's house. And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them. And they were following him. And when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Jesus' disciples, why is he eating and drinking with the tax collectors and the sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, is it not those who are healthy? It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Beautiful line there. Jesus always has the greatest replies, doesn't he? So here's this large crowd. Who is that? Who is in this large crowd at dinner? You're not going to find any Pharisees in there. You're not going to find people who are assiduously following the, the Jewish law in there. You're going to find a lot more tax collectors. You're going to find more am ha adets, right? Those who stand outside the law, they're the ones who would be in a house like that, taking food from someone like Levi from Matthew. No one following the law could even enter the door without becoming ritually unclean. And yet many or most of those sinners, quote unquote, who are in there, were also following Jesus. They were following Jesus. They weren't following the law, but they were following Jesus. Amazing. Jesus recognizes this, of course. And who had the better part, of course? Now, the Pharisees are going to complain. You know that they're going to complain. But they complained to his disciples, not to Jesus. Why would that be? Are they just kind of chicken? They don't want to go right to the source of this thing? Well, for one thing, they can't get to Jesus because they're out in the street. <laughs> Jesus is inside the house. They know he's in there, but they can't go in there to talk to him or complain to him. So they complain to any of the followers who are out in the street with them for whatever reason. Just kind of an interesting thing there. Jesus now is on the inside. And his comment means that he's kind of like a fireman who runs toward the fire, not away from it. Or like a policeman who runs toward the gunfire, not away from it. He's a physician who runs toward the sick and not away from them. Well, of course, where else would he be? He has to be there. He has to be where the people are who form his mission, his purpose, his secret of life, right? So he has made himself now unclean. He's eating and drinking and connecting with these people. And then there's an added detail when we take a look at another parallel in Matthew 9, starting at verse 12. 
But when Jesus heard this, heard what? Well, when he heard the, that the, the Pharisees were complaining about what he was doing, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But he adds this, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So in Matthew's version, Jesus is quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. Hosea is one of the minor prophets, all right, of the Old Testament. The minor prophets, that doesn't mean that they were short people like Zacchaeus. It just means they wrote shorter books, okay? I always wonder about that. There's 12 minor prophets and then a few of the major ones. But uh, he was one of the minor prophets, but he has this beautiful line, God speaking to the people at, at, at uh, chapter 6, verse 6, where God says to him and to the people, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Knowledge of God, not burnt offerings. So for some of you who say that, you know, or, or feel that the God of the Old Testament is not the same as the God of the New Testament because he looks like a genocidal maniac in the Old Testament, here are, there are examples all through the Old Testament where the God that Jesus is talking about is there just rocketing off the page if you're paying attention, if you read. There is a consistency throughout all 66 books of the Bible. Then there's all this other stuff that is thrown in that is really a, an expression of the people, not an expression of God. It's their expression of the way they looked at the world from their point of view three, 4,000 years ago. But here is, I desire mercy. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. I desire knowledge of me, knowing me, and not burnt offerings. Now, here's an example of Jewish poetry. Most of the major prophets are poets, and they're writing in poetic, poetic form. But Jewish poetry doesn't sound like English poetry, where we have rhyme. So we have the same ending sounds. We have the same beginning sounds, alliteration. We have the same middle sounds, assonance, right? rhyme, and all of that to set up the stanzas of our poetry. What Jewish poetry does is repeat concepts and not sounds. And so the same concept will be repeated time and time again. Again, like we talked about, the juxtaposition of these stories reinforces the meaning, gives added facets of meaning to it. Poetry, Jewish poetry, does the same thing. And so it creates this layer. And so what you see is two statements that are saying exactly the same thing, but using slightly different imagery. So in this case, I desire mercy and compassion, not sacrifice, knowledge of God, but not burnt offerings. So what's happening now is that mercy and compassion are the same as the knowledge of God, knowing God. Because mercy and compassion are what God is. God is those things. If you know God, not just about God, learn some theology, but if you have come to know God, yada in Hebrew, which is the word for hand. It means intimate experience, familiarity with God. If you have that, then you know that God is love, that God is mercy and compassion and forgiveness and deliverance and all of those things. That's what he wants from his people, not just blindly following the law and burning livestock on the altar. Yes, the rituals were important. That was the glue that held the community together, an ancient community. But that was only supposed to be pointing the people to this knowledge of God and it was taking care of the secular needs of the community since there was only religious law and no secular law. But he's making this connection. We must, the people must, we must today exceed this religious righteousness that is rooted in a legal system. Matthew 5.20, right? You must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. If you don't, you can never enter the kingdom. We have to get past this following of law, trying to obey our way into God's favor and simply move into relationship with God and know something about him. And then there just seems to be this abrupt change in the next verse, Mark 2, verse 18, right after he talks about the physician was there for the sick and not the well. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and they came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your, Jesus' disciples, do not fast? And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? 
So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. And then he goes on to say, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost in the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. So Jesus is giving us three illustrations here. Because what he's trying to do is approach things from a completely different point of view. And it sounds like he's changed lanes here, or Matthew has changed, Mark has changed lanes here without a signal. But really, this is all going to relate to those three stories. They're all in a row. They're all connected to each other. Now, in the first one, when he talks about that they can't fast while the bridegroom is with them, he's referring to himself as the bridegroom, right? And he's alluding to the Jewish wedding tradition. Now, when the after the betrothal, there could be a gap of a year or two before the Nisuin, which was the actual wedding ceremony itself, was uh, that took place at the father's house, and it was a seven-day-long celebration. Imagine having a wedding ceremony and gathering for seven days, and everybody came to your house and they stayed there for seven days. And he had to feed them and house them and entertain them for seven days. Now, that's if the the bride was a virgin, if it was her first marriage. If she was a widow, then it was only three days. But three days? Can you imagine? Now, while you're doing this, this is a celebration. Everybody is eating and drinking and making merry for as long as the bridegroom is there. But when that period is over and everybody goes back to their own houses, well then. But when you're at that ceremony. You're not fasting. You're eating, of course. You're celebrating. You're drinking. Jesus is using this as an example. Why don't you fast? Well, what's the fasting all about? And you think about it, fasting is the body's natural reaction to loss, right? To trauma, to a longing for something. When you're really going through a loss, when you're going through a grieving, are you, are you really feeling hungry? Do you really want to eat? The body kind of shuts down. And so fasting became associated with grief. Fasting became associated with the longing that we have for something that is lost or something that has not yet materialized in our life. And then, of course, this fasting became ritualized. The Jews were fasting all the time. They would fast ritually twice a week. That was uh, their custom. And the Pharisees were absolutely you know, just locked on to this and assiduous. And they made sure everybody knew that they were fasting twice a week. They would, they would rub ash into their faces so that they would look all sallow, you know, and all sad. And then they'd, they'd contort and they'd let everybody know that they were fasting and, and uh, put on the big hurt so that they could get kudos right in the people's eyes. And then there was a national fasting four times a year that corresponded with four national catastrophes. Again, representing the grief, representing the loss, representing the longing. It was when the temple fell, for instance, those kind of national catastrophes. And then as these fasts became part of the, the, just the fabric of day-to-day living, they became more and more rote. They became more and more superstitious. There were fasts that, would, that people would do in order to have lucky dreams. There were fasts that they, would, that they would do in order to be able to interpret their dreams. There were fasts that they would have in order to ward off evil dreams to obtain things that they wanted to obtain. Rain, there was a very ritualized way of fasting for rain. We would fast for three days, and if it didn't happen by this date, you would fast for three more. So you're trying to bring rain. There was fasting to avoid things like war or pestilence or famine. And all of these became part of the fabric of people, and they understood fasting, and they were doing this, and they wanted to know why Jesus and his disciples were not doing the same thing, because he's approaching things from a completely different perspective. And he gives these three illustrations. So we have the bridegroom. I am here. We are celebrating together. We are celebrating life together. Of course, we're not going to fast. And Jesus didn't break the law But these were oral traditions. These were traditions that had been overlaid, and he was free to break those, he believed. And this is where much of the controversy came between him and the Pharisees. And then he gives us two more illustrations. He's got the patches and he's got the skins. Now think about that for a second. 
You probably all have worn a patched garment at some point in your life. And you know, I mean, it's getting hard because the fabrics that we have and everything is pre-shrunk. But back in the old days when you could get a cotton shirt or even better, you remember the old days of Levi's jeans? And you'd get Levi's jeans, remember they were like stiff as a board? You could lay them between sawhorses and walk across them pretty much because these things, and you had to buy them two sizes too big. And then you had to wash them three or four times before they shrunk down to their final size and hopefully fit you and then we're soft enough to actually wear. This is what he's talking about. So you have have a, if you have an older garment that has already been washed and it's already shrunk to its final size, now you've got a hole in it and you put a patch on it with brand new material that has not shrunk. First time you wash it, that thing is going to shrink down and it's going to pull away. That's what he's trying to tell us. The old versus the new here. And in terms of the wineskins, well, what was a wineskin? Well, in those days, it was literally skin. They would take animal skins and they would stitch it together tight enough to make it waterproof, or they would actually use the bladder of, of their domesticated animals, a sheep or whatever, goats, and they would fill that with new wine. What was new wine? Wine that hadn't fermented yet. Basically, you'd put the grape juice in the wineskin and you'd let it ferment. But when something ferments, it expands. You got the bubbles as the alcohol is being produced. And if you have an old wineskin that has already gone through that process, that means it's already been stretched out. A new skin will stretch with the expansion of the wine. And then you put more new wine in that already stretch, it's going to burst and it's going to lose everything. And so Jesus says you need new wine, right? You need already shrunk fabric to be able to put into these. What is he talking about here? What is he trying to get us to understand? That you can't attach you can't add Jesus' way of relating with God and to the Father into a legal mindset. It doesn't work. Perfect love is never going to be compatible with the law, even with justice. And I don't know how that even sounds to you now. But perfect love is absolutely unjust. It always unbalances the scales of justice, always in favor of the beloved. That's what it does. It is indiscriminate. It doesn't care about performance. It doesn't care whether you are under the law or not. The sun and the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Jesus is saying you can't mix these two. If you have a legal mindset, there is no way that you can patch that with perfect love. There is no way that you can put perfect love into a container like that because it's going to burst. We have to be flexible enough, expandable enough in order to be able to connect with what Jesus is trying to tell us. And he's the bridegroom. He's celebrating life as it is. He's telling us that the container must match the content or it's not going to work. Something is going to get torn. Something is going to get burst. Something is going to get ruined. He's saying that the means that we use must match the ends that we seek or it's never going to work. He's telling us that we're never going to be able to get to the good news if we're living as if the news is bad. If we're living as if we have to perform in order to get the fish from God. If we're living as if God is just waiting to damn us to hell if we don't step up to this line of the line after, then we are never going to get what Jesus is talking about. It's never going to work. But on the other hand, we know that life is hard. It's not a cakewalk, right? We can't be celebrating all the time like Jesus and his followers. So what are we supposed to do? Are we just supposed to pretend that it's not all that bad? We know that we've made a mess out of our lives. We know what we have done to destroy relationships. Are we supposed to just ignore that or pretend that it didn't happen? I wanted to read a couple paragraphs from one of Brother Lawrence's letters. We've been reading these letters, of course, in our book study on Wednesday nights. This is his fifth letter, and it was a letter that was written to someone that he knew. But listen to what he says. Listen to, again, the juxtaposition, the paradox of what he's bringing out. He says, As for what passes in me at present, I cannot express it. I have no pain or difficulty about my state because I have no will but that of God. 
which I endeavor to accomplish in all things, and to which I am so resigned that I would not take up a straw from the ground against his order, or from any other motive but purely that of love to him. I have quit all forms of devotion and set prayers, but those to which my state obliges me. Get that? So in the rule of his house, all these different prayers and devotions, seeing spiritual directors, he stopped it all, except the ones that he absolutely needed to go to. He didn't need them anymore. He was like one of those desert critters that gets all the water it needs from the food it eats. He was already doing that. He didn't need those extras. I make it my business only to persevere in God's holy presence, wherein I keep myself by a simple attention and a general fond regard to God, which I may call an which I may call an actual presence of God, or to speak better, an habitual, silent, and secret conversation of the soul with God, which often causes in me joys and raptures inwardly, and sometimes also outwardly, so great that I am forced to use means to moderate them and prevent their appearance to others. In other words, he gets happy feet and he can't control it. Remember, what was it, Steve Martin, Happy Feet? In short, I am assured beyond all doubt that my soul has been with God above these 30 years. I pass over many things that I may not be tedious to you, yet I think it proper to inform you after what manner I consider myself before God, whom I behold as my king. Listen to this next. I consider myself as the most wretched of men full of sores and corruption, and who has committed all sorts of crimes against his king, God. Touched with a sensible regret, I confess to him in all my wickedness. I ask him his forgiveness. I abandon myself in his hands that he may do what pleases him to do with me. Now riddle me that. Now he fought in the Thirty Years' War before he entered the, the monastery. And the Thirty Years' War was a brutal religious war between France and England. Horrible atrocities occurred in that war. More and more reading Brother Lawrence from the, the training that I've had, I realized he was probably suffering from PTSD. The, the, what he saw in that war, maybe what he participated in in that war, haunted and scarred him and caused him to consider himself in this state even though he was experiencing what he was experiencing from God, he still says, I'm the most wretched of men. I confess regularly all my wickedness. I ask his forgiveness. I abandon myself in his hands that he may do what he pleases with me. How do we reconcile those two things? He has this view of himself, and yet he continues to experience what he experiences from God. He's looking to God for punishment. He's looking to God for suffering over and over in his letters and his writings. He can't understand why he's not suffering. He wants it. He wants the expiation from it for his sins. He feels that he's going to have to go to purgatory and pay for his sins there because you know, he's not paying for them in his life here on earth. You know? Yeah, I know it's a bit neurotic and all that. It also reflects Catholic theology in medieval times in Western Europe. But look where he goes. He says, this king, this God of mine, full of mercy and goodness, very far from chastising me, embraces me with love, makes me eat at his table, serves me with his own hands, gives me the key of his treasures. He converses and delights himself with me incessantly in a thousand and a thousand ways and treats me in all respects as his favorite. It is thus I consider myself from time to time in his holy presence when he's not busy thinking of himself as the most wretched of all men, right? Here's the balance. Here's the balance. Jesus' mission is to remove the shame, to remove the fear that keeps us from connecting with our God and with each other. And of course, only perfect love can do that. Perfect love is unconditional acceptance. The belief in our unworthiness is the old garment. It's the old wineskin that is not compatible with this perfect, degreeless, and indiscriminate love that Jesus is trying to get across. So how is Lawrence so full of joy? 
and yet still seeing himself as the most wretched of men. How does that possibly work? You know, I think Brene Brown may have that answer for us, and I know we've talked about it here before, but just to recall, she took all the people that she interviewed over a 10-year period and said they fell into two groups, those who had connection and those who didn't, in their lives, in their families, whatever. And she said what separated the two was shame, which she defined as the fear of disconnection. That fear that says, I, if I'm not pretty enough, I'm not talented enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not whatever enough to really be worthy of connection. That shame, that fear of disconnection is what divided these two camps of people. So what did the people have who connected that the others didn't? She said they simply believed they were worthy of connection. Well, how did they get there? because they had the courage to be imperfect. They were willing to show up in front of somebody and be vulnerable enough to let them see their imperfection, to stop projecting, to stop trying to pretend that they didn't have the flaws that they did. They just let it show. And when people didn't run screaming from the room and still connected with them and still loved them, they proved to themselves, I must be worthy of connection. Go figure. This is the difference. Brother Lawrence kept showing up. No matter what he felt about himself, he kept showing up to his God, expecting punishment, but getting nothing but continual embraces. David, the beloved of God, look at all he did. From murder to adultery, I mean, just lay it all on him. Always considered the beloved of God. Why? He knew what he did. And he paid the price for that in his own family, but he kept showing up to God. And when you show up to God, you're only going to get goodness because that's all God is. Mercy and compassion and love and forgiveness. That's all you can get from God. We can hold the doubts about ourselves, but if we will keep showing up, vulnerably showing up, God is going to make himself known to us as he did to Brother Lawrence and David and everyone in between to have the courage to be imperfect, to show up in vulnerability. It's in that connection that we experience the joy and the meaning and the fulfillment. But we only can experience that after accepting our own imperfection. We have to accept that. We can't be wishing it away. We can't be fasting it away. We can't be projecting it away. To accept it, to own it. And Jesus is showing us how to do that. This is what he does by accepting us and everyone around him in all their imperfection to accept them before the healing, to accept them before the amends, to accept them before the restitution, before the repentance. Story of the prodigal son over and over again. It's the same story. We are accepted in spite of and maybe because of our imperfections. And then we can only accept this acceptance, this indiscriminate acceptance from God after accepting our own imperfection as God already has. The old garment, the old skins, represent a static mindset, one that doesn't move, that we have to heal ourselves. It's a legal mindset that we have to perform to a certain level before we are accepted. The new patch, the new wineskin, is a dynamic motion of spirit, of degreeless love that bursts through the shame and allows us to connect. Jesus' whole entire mission is to remove the shame, the fear of disconnection that is the blockage to our connectivity, the blockage to our experience of unity. So you want to know the secret of life? You want to know the meaning of life? I think it's this, that what makes us vulnerable makes us beautiful. What makes us imperfect makes us acceptable, connectable. When you think about the friends that you love the most, you probably love their eccentricities. You probably love the things that aren't perfect. 
And if you don't know anything imperfect about a person, then they are still on the pedestal. You don't know them well enough. It's when we get to know each other's imperfections that we bond and we connect and we embrace and we love each other. That's it. The secret of life, what makes us vulnerable and imperfect is what makes us beautiful, acceptable, and connectable. And in accepting our imperfection and showing up anyway to connection as ourselves is what ultimately makes us free. It is the truth that makes us free. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the central piece. Just do that. As scary as it may be, show up and see what happens. Let's pray. Father, you've put all the pieces on the table for us. You've given us all the information. You've shown us over and over again how you roll, how you love, what the central focus is. Help us to work through our fear because it is our fear that keeps us from believing that news this good can actually be true. And we want so desperately for it to be true and to experience the truth of it that can make us free from our fears. So help us to do that. Help us to take those steps in small ways, with family members, with friends, in ways that the risk is minimal enough that we can break through the fear and give pieces of ourselves away, trust people with parts of ourselves and see what happens. And in our prayer life with you, Lord, to practice more and more letting go of the images that we have of ourselves, the illusions we have of ourselves, to be able to see that that's exactly what they are. To do our own fourth step and just be completely factual, ruthlessly honest with ourselves about our own imperfections and then learn to love those as you love them in us and show up anyway. Father, thank you for all of this. Thank you for showing us your love in so many ways. Never let us forget that we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.